Um, welcome everyone. And my name is Nola Wanta and I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy at the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University. So thank you again for joining us for our webinar series, Impact Insights. Impact Insights started this past summer to discuss how businesses are navigating the changing landscape as a result of the COVID pandemic. So as we move into the academic year and establish new norms, we will continue to bring you valuable knowledge and insights and do our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and beyond. This series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the Los Angeles and global community. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like to just quickly go over some guidelines for today's webinar. So as many of you will see on your screen, um, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom. So we will be using this feature to address any of your questions. So please do type in your questions um, in the Q&A feature. And uh, we will be moderating the questions after the talk and presentation. Um, we will also leave time for an interactive Q&A. So you are welcome to raise your hand and we will unmute you. And just as a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So we are so pleased to have our own very own LMU alums, Brett Seifling and Kyle Clark from Gerber Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management. Uh, they are going to be talking to us today about impact investing. Before we get started, I am honored to introduce our LMU alums, Brett and Kyle. Uh, Kyle is an investment, investment advisor and is passionate about learning. Uh, while at LMU, he was a dual degree in economics and political science with a minor in philosophy, so a lot of knowledge there. Out of college, he worked for a venture capital group in San Diego, but he found his passion in finance and wanted to help individuals add value to their lives by making the investing experience exciting and enjoyable. And yes, it can be exciting and enjoyable. Uh, Brett is the director of Get Invested at Gerber Kawasaki, and he has been passionate about investing since he was 14 years old and started a trading blog at the time, which continued through his college years. He's been on TV and recognized by major publications by the Wall Street Journal and Business Insider. Um, he's the first in his family to receive a four-year degree and majored in finance and archaeology. Um, Brett is also passionate about helping others achieve their financial dreams and advises fellow millennials, healthcare professionals, firefighters, and police officers. So definitely making an impact in the community. Um, so without further ado, Brett and Kyle on impact investing. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks guys. Uh, we're really excited today to talk about ESG investing, impact investing, and we think our viewers are, are, and fellow lines are really going to get a, a lot out of this webinar. Um, and so we're excited to, to talk with that um, with you guys today. And before jumping into a lot of the great stuff that Brett and I have, um, as financial advisors, we do want um, to discuss and, and go over some disclosures that we have. And note that everything that we discuss um, here today should not be taken as individual investment advice. And you should always consult with an investment professional before making any personal investment decisions. Yeah, and uh, we also may talk about individual stocks and, and companies that either ourselves hold or firm holds or clients do. So um, it's always just important, like Kyle said, if you're going to make any investment decision, you do want to talk to a licensed professional. Um, don't take what we're saying today and go and try to act on it on your own necessarily. You always want to consult um, with someone who knows what they're doing. So. Um, I'll give a little bit more on my background too. Um, thank you for that wonderful intro. Um, so I actually, you know, grew up here in Southern California and like she mentioned, got into investing super early on in high school um, and really fell in love with financial literacy and investing at a pretty early age. And my trading blog was really focused on healthcare companies and specifically biotech too. Um, and I really found that intersection between being able to help people and invest in some of the clinical trials um, that cure cancer and are basically making some of the best drugs in the world, um, including some that are working on vaccines right now for us so that we can get out of this pandemic and meshed that with finance and the passion to um, basically help others achieve their dreams. So um, that led me to a lot of really cool places and a lot of the same values 
um, that I had growing up matched with the LMU values. And Kyle, I know that you had a lot of these same values that during your experience too. So why don't you give us a little bit of your background on that? Yeah, definitely. And, and so I actually grew up in Sacramento, North Cal, um, and my parents afforded me the amazing opportunity to go to Jesuit high school um, during my adolescence years and uh, ultimately, you know, as well as attending LMU. And, um, you know, both are Jesuit institutions where, you know, their philosophy and core values are really essential to a really holistic approach to education. Um, and so this, you know, philosophy was implemented and, and critical for how we, you know, Gerber Kawasaki also think about, you know, business, investing, and personal financing. Um, and really, as a student at LMU, you know, we're taught to keep in mind really these five pillars that inspire students to integrate knowledge with action so that you can really become leaders and, and transform the world. Right. Um, and, and so we're ingrained the, to practice really the Ignatian values like modus, right, where we strive for excellence in, in really all aspects, being men and women for others and ensuring, you know, that inclusion of marginalized communities are included. Right. And, and forming and educating agents of change, learning to embody these actions um, while integrating the mind, spirit and body. And really, you know, have in, in, in holistic approach, a commitment to service and justice to become a global citizen, right, and, and living a life with purpose. And so not only, you know, have we been shown and, and educated on these topics, um, but really, the next thing is implementing these philosophies in all in your personal investments, um, you know, your personal finances, and really in life. And there are a lot of clients here at Gerber Kawasaki that have asked for customized portfolios and financial plans to invest in, you know, socially responsible companies that we're going to talk about today and really building and crafting plans around things like charitable giving, right, um, providing sustainable solutions and, and money management for a lot of non-for-profits that we work with. And um, honestly, you know, that, that was one of the main reasons why I became a financial advisor here at Gerber Kawasaki and was the reason, uh, you know, I started um, was because of the values that we learned at these Jesuit, I learned at these Jesuit institutions like LMU, um, you know, were found at the firm here at GK. Yeah, and um, GK, for, for those of you guys who don't know, Gerber Kawasaki, um, we're located right next door. Um, we're right here in Santa Monica, just down the road. Um, we've got over 7,000 clients, so all over the world, and we manage about $1.2 billion for them collectively. And we actually have five LMU alumni out of the advisors that work here. And like Kyle said, a lot of the same values are ingrained in our firm as well. And so one important thing is that we're completely independent. So what that means is we don't actually have any proprietary products of our own. And so this is super important when you're doing research because when we're doing research on tens of thousands of different investment options, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, it really gives us an ethical advantage over companies that are proprietary because we don't necessarily have an incentive to put people's money in one thing versus another. And we're also called fiduciaries. So that's another fancy term for meaning we have a legal obligation to do what's in your best interest for your clients. So you guys might be surprised to hear that like most advisors and most financial professionals, especially at like big banks and things like that, they are not fiduciaries and they're not legally tied to do what's in the best interest to the client. So by taking this approach, it really makes us go above and beyond for what the traditional money manager will do. So we not only just work with individuals, but we work with institutions. Um, so we were really happy to see the divest LMU kind of movement when we were getting in contact with you guys. Uh, we love what they're doing. And we do believe that there's a lot of work that the LMU endowment even in our own backyard can do with you know, concentrating on sustainable investments and cutting other things that may be harmful to the environment and other things. So. Um, you know, Kyle, why don't you give us like a brief overview of like where the ESG industry has taken us so far? Yeah, definitely. So the term ESG, um, you know, before that there was known as socially responsible investing, um, which started actually back in the 1970s as investors mostly used negative screening methods to exclude investments like guns, tobacco, gambling, adult entertainment, and, and other vices. 
Um, and so investing in these stocks we're seeing as supporting morally quote unquote bad or socially irresponsible businesses. Um, and you know, that focused only solely on dollars and cents with no real regard for consequences of their business practices. And as we've transitioned as a society, um, we've looked for more sustainable themes of investing and most notably investing with an ESG lens. Um, so socially and responsible investing has really piqued investors' interest for decades. It has gained a lot of traction over recent years. Um, sustainable funds in the U.S. have right around $10.5 billion um, in the first quarter within 2020. And in 2019, they gathered right around $21 billion, um, which was four times the amount back in 2018. And so we expect socially responsible investing will become an increasingly important for investors as they begin to continue to scrutinize the integrity of corporations and their responses to things like the coronavirus, Black Lives, Latin, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And really at Gerber Kawasaki, we've been devoted to diversity and investing into responsibly um, through things like our LGBT group that we have here at the firm, um, our Women of, of Wealth group, um, and our ESG investing group, which focuses on expanding our research on environmental, social, and governance investing. Um, and so from this, Brett, can you explain a little bit more about, you know, what ESG investing is and what type of companies fall under this ESG type of lens? Absolutely. We, we hear these buzz, buzzwords all the time, right? Like ESG, and rarely do we actually break it down and see what, you know, is ESG investing from the beginning. So the E in ESG stands for environmental. And so these are really companies that are focused on combating climate change, lowering their carbon footprints. And if they're able to do that and invest in renewable energy, for example, that can ultimately lower the cost of their bills and affect the bottom line directly. Um, the S stands for social. So these are companies that are socially governed appropriately. And I have some crazy stats for you guys. Um, specifically in the Fortune 500, about 40% of the Fortune 500 companies are actually transparent about the gender and makeup of their company, including wages. Now, out of those 500 companies, only 37 of the CEOs are women, none of which are black women. There's only four black men and there's three that are LGBT and all of those are white. So unsurprisingly, only one out of all 500 companies actually discloses the wage data that breaks down by gender, race, um, and ethnicity, really. And so, you know, this is a definite change that needs to happen in America if we're going to be, you know, promoting some of the best companies in the world, they need to be transparent with the makeup of their workforce and how they're paying their individuals because that it needs to reflect society as a whole. Now, the G stands for governance. And this is also super important because you want to make sure that the companies you're investing in are, are actually doing the right thing. Um, so obviously, if there's any um, corruption in the company or they're getting sued, that's a not good thing for the bottom line. I mean, the thing that comes to mind the most is the recent Goldman Sachs 1MDB scandal uh, where they defrauded a bunch of investors and that actually caught up with them and they were fined $3.9 billion just for that not doing the right thing. So breaking these three categories down through environmental, social, and governance is a good start. Now, there's actually a wide dispersion though of views of like, what is considered an ESG investment? If you ask me what's environmentally friendly, someone else might have a different answer. And so studies have actually shown that these views vary pretty widely, right, Kyle? Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, when you're looking at, you know, some of the top companies that have this ESG lens, um, one of the top companies that comes to mind and is Apple, right? Um, uh, making major headlines consistently. Apple, you know, is, is trading at an evaluation of right around $2 trillion as a company. And it's one of the leaders when it comes to ESG. As an example, Apple announced back in, in the summer, in July 21st of this year, it unveiled its plan to become carbon neutral across its entire business, manufacturing, supply chains, uh, its whole product line life cycle by 2030. And so the company is already carbon neutral today, 
for its global corporate operations um, with its new commitment by means um, that it's going to be uh, as a company wide by 2030. Every Apple device sold will have a net zero climate impact. Um, another great one, you know, that we like is also Microsoft, obviously another major player, um, you know, in the tech space, especially. And Microsoft is incredibly, you know, from a performance standpoint, a great company. Um, and it goes really beyond those impressive numbers, right? Microsoft has already and continues to make substantial strides with the, its commitment to being a great global corporate citizen. Um, you know, so some more details on that in, include them being carbon neutral, um, announcing that back in, in 2012. And it currently powers many of its data centers with the energy efficient solar panels that it uses. Um, furthermore, you know, it's boosting its digital skills of underserved, you know, affordable housing communities, um, you know, youth and minority populations. And it's really helped, um, you know, those surrounding areas by placing headquarters in those under, um, you know, deserved areas and, and really marginalized communities. Um, and so with that, ESG has really ingrained itself within the makeup of this company. Um, and I know NVIDIA, NextGen Energy um, have also been great companies as well with this ESG lens, correct, Brett? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, NVIDIA is the, the number one that comes to mind when it comes to social. Um, I mean, they not only score high on the you know, governance of accounting practices and things like this, but the board makeup. And, you know, a lot of states are actually stepping in, too, um, to make sure that the board makeups of these companies are actually appropriate. So California, for example, stepped in and you needed one woman on the board by 2019. You actually need three, I believe, by 2021. So people are you know, taking steps. Um, to make the companies more diverse. Um, but like NVIDIA, you can see this, like they're, you know, one of the chip leaders in the world and they've just been able to innovate better than anyone. And if you ask the CEO and he's well-documented in this, they attribute it to it because they have one of the most diverse workforces in the world. So, you know, we talk about these individual companies, but individual companies and stocks actually, you know, carry a ton of risk. And that's usually not always the best investment, especially when you're starting out. There's actually things called mutual funds or ETFs. And if you guys don't know what those are, it's a pooled amount of capital with a common objective. And so, you know, Kyle, why don't you kind of go over some of the mutual funds and ETFs that we, you know, look at or have looked at before? Yeah, definitely. You know, for example, with the civil unrest with the Black Lives Matter community, um, it's been worth noting that when it comes to social justice aspects of ESG themes, um, there are ETFs. Um, for example, there's an Impact Shares um, NAACP Minority Empowerment ETF, just as an example. Um, so basically, Association of the Advancement of Color People, right, founded back in 1909, comes in and, and basically provides a long history of, you know, corporate engagement and puts a spin really at the end of the day of its involvement with exchange traded funds, ETFs, and they work forward with an emphasis and a specific criteria. The NAACP developed a list of 10 principles they call screens. Um, for the purpose of the ETF, ranging from, you know, familiarity with the likeness of board and director executives and making sure they have a diverse team, all the way uh, to lesser known ideas like, you know, companies addressing the digital divide and support local communities and development programs. Um, this criteria, when we're talking about race equality within, you know, investment strategies and companies, um, while incorporating a basket of companies or an index like an ETF, it provides great diversification, right? And portfolio allocation um, from that standpoint. And so it's really important to note that these ESG ETFs and mutual funds um, are more expensive, you know, in comparison to say a general S&P 500 ETF, right? Um, but that's due to the work and diligence that goes into the analysis of these companies and making them, you know, properly meet this criteria and outline. Um, and so, Brett, are, are there other, you know, favorite ETFs um, on the environmental absolutely. side? And 
You know, even though they might be more expensive, one could argue that because these companies care about, you know, the environment and social and governance, that they can actually, you know, outperform their peers. And a perfect example of this is this year, I bet you guys didn't know, but one of the best performing sectors of the entire market was actually solar. And so like, if you take an ETF like TAN, which is a ETF fully focused on solar companies, it's actually up 78% this year and up over like 130% in the last six months. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of wonky things that have happened in the market this year, uh, but that just shows you that, you know, even though these things might be a little bit more expensive, you know, it pays to actually look at the future and talk about innovative investments. Now, there are some downsides in that regard to ESG investing, because if you're going to screen out, let's say, all of the vice investments, some of them may be more profitable companies. So naturally, if you're basically picking from a pool of less companies, you have less choices to choose from, and you can't always find the best one. Now, another downside is what I call the Chevron predicament. So if you are using the traditional ESG screens, and we actually like to call these impact investments rather than ESG here at Gerber Kawasaki, and we'll get more into that in a little bit. But what the Chevron predicament is, is that they have actually scored fairly high on the ESG platform because they're a massive donations to the environment. So even though they help the world basically run on old dinosaur juice and are ruining the environment in our opinion, because they, donate $100 million or have committed to that to helping sustainable energy, they're viewed as highly. So we want to really get away from the gimmicks and really get away from, you know, the posturing that companies will often do and really get into who is making the most impact, direct impact to our society with their investments. So now with that being said, there's a lot of upsides. Yeah, definitely. You know, the direct impacts um, the bottom line, right? It directly impacts the bottom line. And so we've seen that um, and we've been seeing that as a shifting towards ESG investing that's estimated over $20 trillion in assets under management um, and around a quarter of all professionally managed assets around the world are moving towards that. Um, RBC, uh, an independent, they came out with an independent research report from a 2019 survey that looked at the responses of over 800 participants around the world and showed that 82% of institutional assets owners and institutional um, investments and consultants believe that ESG integrated portfolios are likely to perform as well or better than non-ESG integrated portfolios. Um, and according to HSBC, um, they came out, you know, with another study showing that over two thirds of institutional investors and nearly 50% of the companies globally have had an ESG policy in place already. Um, and, you know, this is astounding, um, you know, seeing the legislation that's coming out around ESG. Um, proposed by the Labor Department back in June of this year, um, which basically required retirement plan fiduciaries to choose investments based solely on financial considerations. And this was really to slow down ESG investing, which is remarkable given that there's over $10.7 trillion in private pension plans. Um, and you know, with that announcement of that legislation proposal, 95% of the comments that were, um, you know, received as feedback on the, labor, the Department of Labor's proposal opposed that um, uh, suggested of legislation. And so not only does ESG investing, you know, benefit the bottom line, but it's also providing investors a peace of mind that they're doing their part as social and global citizens when it comes to investing in companies that they know are benefiting society within their own portfolios. Um, and so we thoroughly expect this trend to continue, especially with the younger generation, as displayed in, in a study that was done back in 2006 by the Cohen Millennial Case Study, or Cause Study, excuse me, showing that millennials are more likely to trust a company or purchase a company's products when it comes to you know, legislation and being um, for their reputation as socially and environmentally responsible. 
Um, and half of these people um, that were surveyed are more than likely to turn down a product or service from a company that's perceived to be not socially or environmentally responsible or irresponsible. Um, and so there are many ways to make sure that your investments are in line with your philosophy. Um, and so many of our clients at our firm understand that. And, and you know, they understand that annual reports and ESG scores only take you so far, right? The numbers only take you so far. And that's why we you know, look at it from an impact investing standpoint as a major theme behind ESG to provide the results that the ESG criteria you know, outlines. And seeing the actionable steps to investing in great companies from a return standpoint and a moral peace of mind perspective. And so, Brett, you know, there are many individuals, I'm sure, you know, thinking out there, what is the difference between ESG and impact investing? Yeah, and this is something I've thought a lot about and something that when we put this program together, we wanted to make sure that we had a, a clear and concise opinion. And it really boils down to investing in companies that essentially improve people lot in people's lives through successful investing. So using the changing tides in government policy or environmental changes over time, and all of these things can be a key driver for investment outcomes. So the number one thing is sustainability. So when we're looking at companies, we're not necessarily going to toss one out because they fail at one of the scores like governance. So the number one thing that comes to mind and company that comes to mind on this is Tesla, which is one of the companies that our firm is most widely known for was being right on this. And a lot of com people will screen this out because of Elon Musk, who's the CEO, has some crazy antics. He'll go on Twitter and they're like, OK, well, maybe it's not the best governed company when they're arguably doing more for the environment and battery storage and EV for anyone in the world. Um, so companies like Tesla or Next Era Energy, which we haven't talked about, um, which is, you know, wind and solar is now the cheapest option for two thirds of the world. And so this is a company that's come in, taken the old power plants, redeveloped them and made it a lot cheaper and profitable. So we're looking for companies that, you know, have a unique edge in that sense through our program. And a few more ideas that come to mind is not just solar, um, is electric vehicles and battery storage or cybersecurity. Um, there's also sustainable chemicals. Not a lot of people know that there's actually a new chemical that's supposed to replace the traditional plastic and plastic bottles that we use um, coming out by 2022. So when we're looking at it, it really just boils down to improving people's lives through successful investing. Awesome. Great. Yeah. And, you know, we do want to get to the Q&A part um, of this of this webinar. Um, and so we're happy to, at this point in time, take any questions um, from anyone that, that wants uh, to ask a question. Yeah, I think I see some in here already. So yeah. um, we can kind of just jump on into them if you don't mind, Nola. Sure. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to. So we have a question yeah. from Fiona. Um, and this is great because I think for some who may not be in finance, it would be good to know. Uh, could you explain the difference between mutual funds and ETFs? Yeah, yeah. so um, it's, we get this question a lot. Um, and so mutual funds are actually the, the older school way of, of investing. And they've been around since like the 1920s. Um, there's about $19 trillion actually invested in mutual funds um, just in the US. So you can tell that they're very popular ways for Americans to build wealth. Now there's an active manager. So all it is, it's a pooled amount of capital and to a fund and there's a team that's making investment decisions, whether that's you know on a certain sector, whether it's to grow the money, whether it's to produce income, whether it's to invest in a specific sector of the economy. Um, so they have an active management team. Now ETFs are much newer um, and they're about 30, 40 years old, and there's no, actually, there's no actual fund manager making decisions. So typically an ETF will track like an index, um, like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ, where it's just tracking that as closely as possible, um, or a specific sector, like we mentioned, solar, um, where you're buying, you know, if you buy into one of these funds or ETFs, they'll typically hold anywhere from like, let's say 50 to 250 different companies. So it's also a great way to get diversified. 
Um, so there's a lot of advantages to both. And especially when you're just starting to invest, a lot of people will start off with mutual funds or ETFs because stocks can be very expensive. If you want to go buy one share of Amazon right now, it's about $3,000 for one share. And if Amazon doesn't do that well that year, you're kind of out of luck. So you could rather buy a fund that maybe holds 50 different companies, 4% in Amazon, 3% in Netflix, 2% in Microsoft, so on and so forth, and have a, a better portfolio over time. Fantastic. Thank you for that explanation. Um, we have a question here. So is investing in ESG companies more profitable because society is caring more about the ethics and morals of companies, as well as how they are impacting the world? Also, do you think that consumers will shift to purchasing goods and services from high scoring ESG companies? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so ESG investing is becoming more and more popular. So more and more people are kind of looking at these companies and giving them capital. Um, so, you know, they can be more well capitalated and studies have shown that just because they do care about these things, that it does directly fall to the bottom line and does make them more profitable over time. So if you're looking at sustainability, I definitely think that that equals profitability. Now, the second portion of that was, do I think, you know, consumers will shift their behavior to these companies? And absolutely. I mean, we, we see this cancel culture almost every day now um, that it's become kind of a running joke in our society that if people will just cancel anything. Um, and so certainly if you are, you know, a vice investment um, or if you don't care about these things, when we know that society does, you can certainly, um, you know, see customers shift away from that behavior. Absolutely. Definitely. And, and with that, too, you know, we are seeing as younger generations, especially with millennials and Gen Zers, you know, the shift to companies that are, they know and understand are being socially responsible. Um, you know, Philip Morris has really taken a, a big impact because of their tobacco type products and, you know, moving away from companies like that to more sustainable companies um, that they know are making a great impact. Um, not from a, just a social aspect, but also from an environmental aspect. Um, and we definitely continue to see this trend moving forward, especially with great companies, um, you know, that, that we think are going to be around for a long, long time. So just to follow up on that really quick, are you guys seeing companies responding to the shift in morals and values of, of consumers? So changing their governance, you know, outside of of what policies are actually being put in place. Like, do you guys, are you guys seeing companies make this shift? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely hit or miss. Um, companies that care about it, care about it. And those that don't kind of tried to hide it. Um, so like we kind of mentioned over the, you know, Fortune 500 companies, you would think that, you know, companies that are that in the public eye um, would care about these things and care about the transparency. Um, but these shifts don't happen overnight. Right. So this is more of a generational shift in mindset going from, you know, where the boomers thought it's all about dollars and cents. It's all about the bottom line. You should just care about investing in a logical and rational way into, wait a second, there's more to this. And it's not only just what they're showing the public. We want to see them actually be sustainable through the entire supply chain, including like all stakeholders. So, you know, if Nike, for example, is, um, you know, selling shops here and they have a diverse workforce and all this stuff in America, that's great. But if, you know, they're basically using sweatshops in other countries to make their shoes, then, you know, they're probably not the best impact investment. So, you know, there's, there's a give and take there for sure. And also too, we're seeing a lot of the innovators, you know, whether that's from a product standpoint or a company standpoint, really be more aggressive when it comes to ESG, right? Like the companies that we talked about that are some of our top favorites, the Apples, the Microsofts, the Teslas, these companies that are innovative in their respective spaces are also being super innovative when it comes to ESG and being more of, you know, a socially responsible, environmentally responsible company just in their microfibers of their business practices. Um, and so that's also a big trend I think we're also seeing with a lot of these companies um, and their likelihood of moving to a more ESG responsible um, type of company. Fantastic. Actually, that ties into a question from Brian. Um, who do you see as top forward thinking sustainable companies 
who are successfully investing, a top three would be awesome. I know you mentioned Microsoft, Tesla, and so forth, but are there any other ones that we may not know about? Um, yeah, I can take this one. So um, Nextera Energy, which is one that I, I did mention in the presentation, but honestly, I think that they're one of the top um, companies that's been able to innovate in the renewable energy space. Um, so they've been able to go in, like I said, and lower the cost of basically wind and solar plants. And it's now the cheapest option for two thirds of the world. So when you have an entire industry shift off of like coal and into something like wind and solar, and you can capitalize on that. And as a utility company, which is traditionally not known for growth, um, they've been an amazing hybrid of being able to do both of those things. Um, another company that we like is, is Prologix, which it does a lot of basically logistics and warehouse holding. Um, and I won't go too much into them. And another one is Solar Edge, um, which is another actually company out of Israel um, has been doing amazing things with these solar inverters. And so, um, you know, those three um, are, are the first that kind of come to mind that are maybe like under the radar, you could say, um, and not in the mainstream of like Apple and Microsoft and the big mega cap companies that kind of everyone knows. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I wondered if, if the energy industry is, is also booming and based on your response, definitely. So that's great. Um, can, you make, uh, can you make recommendations, general strategies for those of us who don't have a lot to invest but want to start right away as new grads? Also, if I get a job with a 401k, how do you advise me to manage that to maximize opportunities given we're in our early 20s? Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously for general strategies, you know, things like that, it, it's really hard. It, it really depends on your personal um, situation. And, and so with that being said, you know, that's exactly what we help with all the time. I have, Brett and I both actually have a number of clients, uh, graduates from LMU, um, as well as, you know, current students at LMU. And so we've been really helping. We have a program called, um, the, uh, we have a wealth building program here at the firm that's really designed for people specifically, um, you know, young, successful individuals that are looking to get ahead in life. Um, and so with that, you know, 401k in general, you know, we do recommend if they offer it, um, look at the options that they provide you. Do they offer things like a match? Right. What are the investments that they're offering in the investment lineup? Each company is very different. So it really just depends on the company that you're a part of. Um, and then ultimately, you know, doing your due diligence and ultimately consulting with a, an investment professional as well. It's making sure you're making the right decisions and maximizing that potential um, that you have for, you know, and, and the biggest thing is that as young investors, your biggest asset is time. Right. So the most important thing is to get started. Um, not waiting because, you know, you can never get that time back. Um, use youth on your side as the best asset for investing, especially. Yeah, Kyle, I mean, you said it best, like time beats money and it will every single time. And so we actually don't even have minimums in this wealth building program that he's talking about. So if you guys do have questions, we have plenty of young advisors who will sit down with you for free because of this webinar um, for an hour and go over your situation and can kind of give you more personal advice to you as the individual. Um, and something else is that I'll leave you with this question is, is a process called dollar cost averaging. And this is a really neat tool um, that is why 401ks are actually so successful over time is because it's a method of taking a fixed amount of money and investing it on fixed time periods. So like, let's say you have, you know, five grand to invest instead of like investing all $5,000 all in one chunk, you break it up and let's say over the next five months, invest $1,000 per month. And what happens is you don't have to necessarily time the market. It's really all about time in the market. So months when the market's high and a little bit more expensive, you'll pick up a little bit less shares and months when the market's low, you'll pick up a little bit more shares and ultimately average to a better cost basis and ultimately um, get the company at the good price that you wanted. Fantastic. Uh, do you think ESG funds are outperforming because the companies are ESG focused or because ESG funds are often overweight in tech for growth related companies, which have outperformed the market? So which do you guys think? Yeah, great, great question. And I think it's, it's that that's difficult to answer. You know, it's really a chicken, chicken or the egg came first type question. 
right? Um, is, is it, you know, these are great companies starting out and then as ESG has been moving and developing, they just so happen to fit within this criteria or, you know, was ESG, you know, a criteria that a lot of companies have shifted their business practices to. Um, I can't, you know, and Brett, you can also comment on this as well, but I, I don't think it's a one versus another. I think it's a natural emergence as a society when we become more conscientious about these different topics. And really, I think it's part of the digital economy that we're in and, you know, the news, the amount of speed that news comes and our ability to communicate with one another has really been able to put a really close microscope on a lot of these companies and call into question a lot of their business practices, which I think has naturally emerged as ESG lens um, with understanding, you know, we want to make sure we're doing the right thing and not just, you know, impacting the bottom line as a sole focus for investing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's important with benchmarking too. Like if you're going to compare funds to certain funds, you got to make sure that if you're, you know, looking at an ESG tech fund, um, you should benchmark that to technology companies. So, you know, a lot of people will try to benchmark things against, you know, and just kind of make up their own um, outperformance. So you have to, you know, really be careful um, with figuring out um, the actual data behind that. Great. Um, how would you recommend finding ESG ETFs and mutual funds to invest in? Additionally, where can we find information about individual companies' ESGs related scores? Yeah, so a great start is um, to follow us on social media. Um, we're putting out great content about these things every single day. So at Gerber Kawasaki on Instagram or Twitter, or mine is at B Siffling Trades, which is my first initial last name. Um, and we put a ton of this content out there. I'm constantly looking at these companies, constantly looking at the different funds. Now, as far as like a collection or um, database that has all of them, I don't can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, a lot of the research tools uh, in finance, unfortunately, cost a lot of money. I know that you, since I left, I think you guys installed some Bloomberg terminals at the actual school. So those are pretty advanced, but I'm sure that if you got onto that and gained some experience in it, that there's absolutely a way to break those down and kind of strip out that information. That's great. And actually for our students out there, we do have Bloomberg terminals. We've got a number of them. So, so jealous. So yes. jealous. <laughs> yes. And um, it, it does provide a wealth of information. Um, we also have Bloomberg market concepts that really helps you get familiarized with, with, um, with the terminals, the market and so forth, and all of the data that's available in there. I also know Bloomberg's been doing a lot of work around um, energy impact, sustainability, and so forth. So fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, what are some ways to find hidden corruption in companies that boost their ESG scores? That's a good question. Um, so, I mean, we're, you're smart kids than people that are watching this, right? And um, you can see through it. Um, if you kind of look through the posture and look through what they're donating money to and like get down to like what actually affects their business is the most important part. So again, we're looking for companies that are improving society through successful investing. So, you know, if you're in an oil company or in the energy industry, it's probably pretty hard to actually become an impact investment because you're in something that we know um, is affecting climate change from a science perspective. So, um, there's industries that it's almost impossible. There's industries like tech where it comes a lot more natural. Um, so, you know, there's, it, it just really depends. That's great. Um, and one question um, to clarify, I don't think you mentioned the name of the company that was working on chemicals that would replace plastic and would love to know who that company is. Unfortunately, it's still private, so um, you can't even invest in it. Um, <laughs> But we know someone out there is doing it. There's so many great companies doing some very interesting things in, in this space, especially around plastic. Yeah. Um, how can GK help me create a portfolio to own companies that share sustainable values but aren't necessarily considered an ESG company? I would like to maximize my returns while still caring about our future. 
Yeah, I mean, we do this with all of our investments. It's naturally what we do here. So we're when we go through our investment process and our investment committee meetings every single week, um, we're naturally looking at companies that are going to make an impact. Now, with that being said, we can you know strip out certain things. Whether you care, you know, maybe you have like religious preferences. Um, there's ways that you can not invest companies that affect that. Um, there, or if you want more of a social tilt or anything like that, we can basically customize the portfolio to what you want. Um, but there's kind of two levels to it. There's pure impact investing, and then there's just us naturally looking through this theme of ours and these major investment themes like electric vehicles or solar or cybersecurity or all of these themes are what we believe is going to make the greatest returns over the next let's say three to five years so it comes hand in hand at our firm i wouldn't say necessarily that it's like that everywhere um, but we just have a natural tendency to do so Definitely. And, and also the big thing that we take in consideration is, you know, your time horizons with this investments, right? And making sure, you know, it's in alignment with what you're ultimately trying to achieve with your goals. And that's what we do through our discovery process um, that we can help and assist with and, and making sure that you guys are ultimately achieving what you want with your investments um, in your portfolios. Wonderful. And then Jack asked, you guys said that you would sit down with us as students and analyze and, analyze and give advice on our own situation free of charge. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, we don't have any minimum. So if you're actually looking to invest, um, we're happy to offer anyone on the webinar a complimentary consultation. Um, go through your situation, you know, things like a budget analysis, a net worth analysis, um, educate you on the different options that you do have out there, um, ultimately put a plan together um, to enact that um, based on whatever goals you do have. Um, so just reach out to us. Um, I believe we can probably provide our emails, um, which is best, and you can just email either Kyle or I directly, um, and we can coordinate a time to figure that out with you guys. You guys can also reach out to us at uh, on our website at gerberkawasaki.com. Um, and that way you guys can sign up, get in a free, contact us, um, email us. We're also very active on social media um, at Kyle Clark19 on Instagram. And I know Brett's very active on social media with Twitter um, at Bsiflin Trades. And so um, we're more than happy to connect with any alumni, um, any current student that, that's interested in getting started and wants that free initial consultation. Yeah. And so our emails is just very simple. It's Brett, B-R-E-T-T, at GerberKawasaki.com and Kyle at GerberKawasaki.com. So fairly easy to remember. Yeah, and I'll be sure to include their email addresses to everyone um, with the recording of this webinar because um, there's just so much great information. So I'll be sure to include your emails to share with, with the group. And then um, our dean also mentioned that the Bloomberg Market Concept is available virtually on all the students' laptops. Um, so you can get certified and learn how to do research on Bloomberg. All you need is your LMU email address um, to get Bloomberg certified and it's self-paced. Um, and you know, it's really preparing our students to, to get ready and, and, you know, to be back on the terminals. Um, are there any other questions out there? Um, you're also welcome to raise your hand and, and talk uh, directly to um, our speakers today. Um, is there anything else? Well, while we wait for questions, do you guys have any other additional um, tips or any additional um, insights you would like to share with the group regarding impact investing and how it's really just changing, you know, constantly and even in, in today's world. So anything else you'd like to add? I think the number one thing is, is don't afraid to, to get started. Um, you know, a lot of people think that um, because of like the election or because of COVID or all these different reasons that it's not a good time to get into the markets and get ahead. Um, and in fact, that's, that's, you know, we've seen the markets at all time highs. We've, we've seen amazing progress um, so far. And even just a little bit of, of money every single month um, can add up to a lot over time. And, um, you know, don't go get overwhelmed because there's a lot. Finance is very complicated. You know, if you're going to do it on your own, maybe just pick a few companies and read about them and read about their filings and, and just follow it. Because a lot of people forget, especially since um, 
you know, other brokers like Robinhood have kind of gamified investing that you're actually investing in businesses, not just tickers on a screen. So um, remember that it's all about the business um, and then the rest should come naturally. Definitely. And I couldn't reiterate that more, like getting started now, you know, full disclosure, back when I was a student at LMU, my sophomore year, I started my first, you know, investment account that I opened up with my work study job, um, with the extra money that, that I was earning and, and being able to, you know, understand the markets um, and really making sure, you know, again, that you're investing in great companies. Again, for, for younger students out there, your biggest asset is time. Um, and time is on your side. And again, you don't want to time the market because that's a very difficult game. You just want to spend the most time in the market. Even the most famous investor in the world, Warren Buffett, um, he says that the greatest asset to him and why he's been so successful is because of time. Um, and so that's the biggest piece of advice that I think, if anything, from you guys take away from this webinar, it's to get started rather than waiting. Fantastic. Well, if no one else has any questions, I'd like to thank our speakers for joining us today and sharing their knowledge and experience um, around ESGs and impact investing, um, because I do believe that it is the wave of the future. We're seeing the investments move markets, right? And especially with clean energy, you know, electric vehicles, just so many things, tech. And I have become a firm believer that that's what's carrying the market today. So um, the values and morals that we possess really, really do show, you know, on, in, in, in the market. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for all of our attendees for joining us. Um, so next Thursday, we will have another web webinar with one of our LMU um, MBA grads as well, who will talk to us about the impact of COVID-19 on real estate investments. So, Thank you so much, everyone, and we will see you in our next webinar. Thank you, Brett and Kyle. So thank you. Thank you.